live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and Intel, along with its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to the Sands Convention Center in Las Vegas, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante, I'm here with my co-host Justin Warren. This is day one of our coverage of AWS reInvent 2019. Naveen Rao is here, he's the Corporate Vice President and General Manager of Artificial Intelligence, the AI Products Group at Intel. Good to see you again, thanks for coming to theCUBE. Absolutely, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So, what's going on with Intel and AI? Give us the big picture. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually the very big picture is I think uh, the world of computing is really shifting. Um, the, the, the purpose of what a computer is made for is actually shifting. And I think uh, uh, from its very conception, you know, from Alan Turing, the machine was really meant to be something that uh, recapitulated intelligence. And we took sort of a divergent path where we, we built applications for productivity, but now we're actually coming back to that original intent. And uh, I think that hits everything that Intel does because we're a computing company. We supply computing to the world. So everything we do is actually impacted by AI and will be in service of building better AI platforms for intelligence at the edge, intelligence in the cloud, and everything in between. It's really come full circle. I mean, I mean when I first started this industry, AI was the big hot topic. And really, Intel's ascendancy was around personal productivity, but now we're seeing machines replacing cognitive functions yeah. for humans. That has implications to society. Um, but there's a whole new set of workloads that are emerging. And, and that's driving presumably different requirements. So what, what, what do you see as the sort of infrastructure requirements for those new workloads? What's Intel's point of view on that? Well, so maybe let's focus that on the cloud first. Um, any kind of machine learning algorithm typically has two phases to it. One is called training or learning, uh, where we're really iterating over large data sets to fit, fit model parameters. Then once that's been done to a satisfaction of whatever uh, performance metrics are, or that are relevant to your application, it's rolled out and deployed. That, uh, that, that phase is called inference. And so um, these two are actually quite different in their requirements and that inference is all about uh, the best performance per watt. How, how much uh, processing can I shove into a particular time and uh, uh, power budget? On the training side, it's much more about what kind of flexibility do I have for exploring different types of models and training them very, very fast. Because uh, when this field kind of started taking off in 2014, 2013, uh, typically training a model back then would take a month or so. Uh, those models now take minutes to train and the models have grown substantially in size. So we've still kind of gone back to a couple of weeks of training time. So anything we can do to reduce that is very important. And why the compression? Is that because of just so much data and you're- It's data you're and- to act on it and the yeah, it's, power? Or? It's data, uh, the sheer amount of data, the complexity of data, and the complexity of the models. So a uh, very uh, broad or, or, or a rough categorization of the complexity can be the number of parameters in a model. So back in 2013, there were, call it 10 million, 20 million parameters, uh, which was very large for a machine learning model. Now they're in the billions. One or two billion is sort of the state of the art. Uh, to give you a, a bearings on that, the human brain is about three to 500 trillion models. So we're still pretty far away from that. So we got a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things about these models is that once you've trained them, then they do things. That's but right. understanding how they work, like these are incredibly complex mathematical models. So are we at a point where, where we just don't understand how these machines actually work, or, or do we have a pretty good idea of, no, 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 when, when this model's trained to do this thing, this is how it behaves? Well, it really depends on what you mean by how, uh, how much understanding we have. Uh, so, um, I'll say at one extreme, we trust humans to do certain things, and we don't really understand what's happening in their brain. Uh, we trust that there's a process in place that, you know, uh, uh, that, 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 that has tested them enough. Like, the neurosurgeon's cutting into your head, you say like, you know what, there's a system where that neurosurgeon probably had to go through a ton of training, be tested over and over again, and now we trust that he or she is doing the right thing. I think the same thing is happening in, uh, in AI. Some aspects we can, we can bound and say, uh, uh, I, I have analytical methods on how I can measure performance. In other ways, other places, it's actually not so easy to measure the performance analytically. We have to actually do it empirically, which means we have data sets that we say, um, does it stand up to all the different tests? Uh, one area we're seeing that in is autonomous driving. Autonomous driving, uh, 
It's a bit of a black box, and the amount of situations one can occur, incur on the road are almost limitless. Yeah. So what we say is, like, for a 16-year-old, we say go out and drive, and eventually you sort of learn it. Same thing is happening now for autonomous systems. We have these training data sets where we say, do you do the right thing in these scenarios? And we say, okay, we trust that uh, you'll probably do the right thing in the real world. Well, we, we know that, uh, that Intel has partnered with AWS around autonomous driving with their Deep Racer project, and uh, I right. believe it's on Thursday is the, is the grand final. Uh, it's right. been running for, let me, I think it was uh, announced on theCUBE last year, and uh, there's been a whole bunch of competitions running all year. Uh, basically training models that run on this Intel chip inside a little model car that drives around a, a racetrack. Yeah. So you're speaking of empirical testing of whether or not it works, like exactly. lap times gives you a pretty good, good idea. So wh what have you learned from that experience of having all of these people go out and, and learn how to use these, these AI models on a real live race car and, and race around a track? Well, I think there's several things. I mean, uh, one thing is when you turn loose a number of developers on a competitive thing, you, you get really interesting results, right? People find creative ways to use the tools to try to win. So I always love that process. I think competition is how you, how you push technology forward. Um, on the tool side, it's actually more interesting to me is that you know, we had to come up with something that was um, adequately uh, simple so that a, a large number of people could get going on it quickly. You can't have somebody who spends a year just getting the basic infrastructure to work. So we had to put that in place. Um, and really, I think that's still an iterative process. We're still learning what, what we can expose as knobs, what, what kind of uh, areas of innovation we allow the user to, to explore, um, and where we sort of lock it down to make it easy to use. So I think that's the biggest learning we get from this, is how I can deploy AI in the real world, and what's really needed from a tool chain standpoint. Can you talk more specifically about what you guys each bring to the table with your collaboration with AWS? Yeah, I mean, AWS has been a great partner. Uh, obviously, AWS has a, uh, a huge ecosystem of developers, uh, all kinds of different developers. I mean, web developers are one sort of developer, database developers are another, uh, AI developers are yet another. And uh, we're kind of partnering together to, to empower that AI base. Uh, what we bring from a technological standpoint, of course, are the hardware. Uh, right. Our CPUs are um, AI ready now with a lot of software that we've been putting out in the open source. And then other tools like OpenVINO, which make it very easy to start using AI models on our hardware. And so we tie that in to the infrastructure that AWS is building for something like DeepRacer, and then help uh, build a community around it, an ecosystem around it of developers. I want to I go back to the, the point you're making about the black box AI. Man, people yeah. are concerned about that, they're concerned about explainability. Do you, do you feel like that's a function of just the newness um, that, that will eventually get over it. I mean, I could think of so many examples in my life where I can't really explain how I know something, but I know it and I trust it. <laughs> Do you feel like it's sort of, um, you know, a, a tempest in a teapot? Yeah, I, I think there's, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about, uh, you know, the traceability of a financial transaction, we kind of need that maybe for legal reasons. Yep. So even for humans we do that. You got to write down everything you did. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? So we actually want traceability for humans even. In other places, I think it is really about the newness. Um, do I really trust this thing? I don't know what it's doing. Trust comes with use. Uh, after a while, it becomes pretty straightforward. I mean, uh, I think that's probably true for a cell phone. I, I remember the first smartphones coming out in the uh, early 2000s, like, I didn't trust how they worked. I would never do a credit card transaction on them, these kind of things. Now it's like, take it for granted. So I've done it a million times, and I never had any problems, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the opposite in social media, most well, people. Well, <laughs> maybe that's the opposite. <laughs> Let's not go down that path. <laughs> quite like Dr. Kate Darling's uh, analogy from, from, from MIT Lab, uh, which is that we already have AI and we're quite used to them. They're called dogs. Um, we don't <laughs> fully understand how a dog makes a decision, and yet we use them every day. That's so, right. Yeah, in a collaboration with humans. So the you know, dogs sort of replace a particular dog, but then again, they don't. I don't particularly want to go and sniff things all day long. <laughs> So having, having AI systems that can actually replace some of those jobs, it's actually, that's kind of great. Exactly, and think about it like this, if we can build systems that are tireless, uh, and we can you know, basically give them more power and they keep going, that's a big win for us. And actually the dog analogy is great because I, I think at least my eventual goal as an AI researcher is to, be, to make the interface for intelligent agents be like a dog, to train it like a dog. Reinforce it um, for the behaviors you want and, you know, uh, uh, keep pushing it in new directions that way, as opposed to having to write code that's kind of esoteric. Can you yeah. talk about GANs? What is GANs? What's it stand for? What does it mean? General, uh, 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 generative adversarial networks. Okay. Uh, what this means is that, you can kind of think of it as, um, 
two competing sides of, a, of solving a problem. So um, if I'm trying to make a fake picture of you that, I don't know, uh, makes you look like you have no hair or like, like me, um, you, know, you can see a Photoshop job and you can kind of tell, oh, that's, that's not so great. So one side is trying to make the picture and the other side is trying to guess whether it's fake or not. If you have two neural networks that are kind of working against each other, one's generating stuff and the other one's saying, is it fake or not? And then eventually you keep improving each other. This one tells that one, no, I can tell. This one goes and tries something else. This one says, no, I can still tell. The one that's trying to, with a discerning network, once it can't tell anymore, you've kind of built something that's really good. That's, that's, that's sort of the general principle here. So we basically have two things kind of fighting each other to, to, to get better and better at a particular task. Like deep fakes. <laughs> I use that because it is a relevant uh, it use is. case and that's kind of where it came from. It's from GANs. <laughs> right, okay. And so, uh, wow, obviously relevant with 2020 coming up. Um, I, I want to ask you, I mean, how far do you think we can take AI, two part question, how far can we take AI in the near to midterm, you know, yeah. let's talk you know, our lifetimes, and then how far should we take it? And maybe you can uh, address some of those thoughts. So how far can we take it? Well, uh, I think you know, we, we, we often have the sci-fi narrative out there of you know, building killer machines and this and that. I, I don't know that that's actually going to happen anytime soon for several reasons. One is we build machines for a purpose. Uh, they, they don't come from an embattled um, evolutionary past like we do. <laughs> so so th their, their motivations are a little bit different, say. Um, so that, that's one piece. And, you know, they're really purpose-driven. Also, building something that's as general as a human or a dog is very hard, and we're not anywhere close to that. When I talked about the trillions of parameters that a human brain has, like we might be able to get close to that from an from a engineering standpoint, but we're not really close to making those trillions of parameters work together in such a coherent way that a human brain does, and efficient. Human brain does that in 20 watts. To do it today it would be multiple megawatts. So it's not really something that's easily uh, uh, found just laying around. Um, now, how far should we take it? I think I look at AI as uh, a way to push humanity to the next level. Let me explain what that means a little bit. Um, simple equation I always sort of write down is like people are like, oh, radiologists aren't going to have a job. No, no, no. What it means is one radiologist plus AI equals 100 radiologists. I can take that person's uh, capabilities and scale it almost freely to millions of other people. It basically increases accessibility of expertise. We can scale expertise. That's a good thing. It makes solves problems like we have in healthcare today. Right? That's where we should be going with it. Well, a good example would be, you know, when, and probably part of the answer is today, when will, will machines make better diagnoses than, than doctors? I mean, in some cases it probably exists today, but not broadly, but that's a good example, right? It is, it's a tool though. So I, I look at it as more a, giving a human doctor more data to make a better decision on. So what AI really does for us is it doesn't limit the amount of data on which we can make decisions. As a human, all I can do is read so much, or hear so much, or touch so much. That's, that's my limit of input. If I have an AI system out there listening to billions of observations, and actually presenting data in a form that I can make better decisions on, that's a win. It allows us to actually move science forward, uh, to move uh, accessibility of technologies forward. So keeping that context of that time frame I said, something in our lifetimes, however you want to define that, when do you think that, that, or do you think that driving your own car will become obsolete? I don't know that it'll ever be obsolete, you know, and I'm a little bit biased on this, so I, I actually race cars. It's like, Me uh, too, and I drive a stick, so. Well, I, I kind of race them <laughs> semi-professionally, so it's like, I don't want that to go away, but it's the same thing, like we don't need to drive, ride horses anymore, but we still do for fun, so I don't think it'll completely go away. Now, what I think what will happen is that um, commutes will be, will, will, will be changed. We will now use autonomous systems for that. And I think you know, five, seven years from now, we will have, we will be using autonomy much more on prescribed routes. It won't be that it completely replaces a human driver even in that time frame because it's a very hard problem to solve in a completely general sense. So it's going to be a, a kind of gentle evolution over the next 20 to 30 years. Do you think that that AI will change the the manufacturing pendulum and perhaps some of that would swing back to? sort of in this country anyway, onshore manufacturing or? Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I, I was in Taiwan uh, a couple of months ago and you're actually seeing that already. You're seeing things that, you know, uh, maybe were much more labor intensive before because of economic constraints are becoming more mechanized using AI. AI as an inspection. Did this machine install this thing right? So you have an inspector tool and you have an AI machine building. It's a little bit like a GAN, you can think of it, right? Yeah. And so this is happening already and I think that's how, that's, that's one of the good parts of AI is that it takes away those sort of like, 
you know, harsh conditions that humans had to be in before to build devices. Do you think AI will uh, eventually make large you know, retail stores go away? Uh, well, I think as long as there are humans who, uh, who want um, uh, immediate satisfaction. That's, yeah, <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know that it'll completely go away. Uh, some, uh, some humans enjoy shopping. How about, some people like browsing. Uh, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it depends how fast you need to get it. And, and then my last AI you know, question, do you think banks, will, traditional banks, will lose control of the payment systems as a result of things like machine intelligence? Yeah, I, I, I do think there are going to be some significant, significant shifts there. We're already seeing, you know, many payment companies out there automate several aspects of this and, and reducing the friction of moving money. Moving money between people, moving money between different types of assets like stocks and bitcoins and things like that. And um, you know, I, I think AI is it's a critical component that people don't see because it actually allows you to make sure that um, first you're, um, you're doing a transaction that makes sense. Like when I move from this, th this currency to that one, I have some sense of what's a real number it's much harder to defraud. And that's a critical element to making these technologies work. So you need AI to actually make that happen. All right, all right we'll give you the last word. Um, just maybe you want to talk a little bit about what we can expect, AI futures, or anything else you'd like to share. I, I think it's, we're, at, we're at a really critical inflection point where we have something that works, basically, and we're going to scale it, scale it, scale it to, do, to bring on new capabilities. Um, it's going to be really expensive for the next few years, but we're going to then throw more engineering at it and start bringing it down. So I start seeing this look a lot more like a brain, something where we can start having intelligence everywhere at you know, various levels, very low power, uh, ubiquitous compute, and then very high power compute in the cloud, but bringing these intelligent capabilities everywhere. Levine, it's a great guest, so thanks so much for coming to theCUBE. Thank really you, thanks for having it. me. You're yeah, really welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest, Dave Vellante from Justin Warren. You're watching theCUBE live from AWS reInvent 2019. We'll be right back. <laughs>